Here we are on another amazing episode of the Trash Talk Business Podcast. This is our weekly time to grow, learn, and build our junk removal dreams. As always, I'm Andy Wines. Joined, well, Casey's late. I don't even know how to say this, right? We're doing a live show. This is a legit operation. We're eight, I even know the number this week, live live show number, or, well, live show number, like, I don't know, seven. Uh, overall episode number 86, I saw it in the notes. I've done my research. We got a guest. I'll be Casey today also, I suppose. Casey will be here shortly. We got a guest, and like true Casey Bubba Lawrence fashion, uh, he has a name. His name's Adam. And uh, Adam, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, Adam Hosmer. I'm from uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, full-time right now, I do construction. I'm a construction foreman. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a lot of free time on my job. So naturally, I wanted to start something uh, something yeah. on my own. So yeah, we got into the dumpsters back in 21, and it's kind yeah. of evolving slowly. All right. What uh, what size cans you got out there? Uh, 10, 12, 15, and 20s so far. Okay. How many, how many total cans, roughly? Just 12, 12 cans. Okay. We're kind of growing somewhat organically because I'm, I mean, I work 50 hours a week minimum, so it's real hard to devote, you know, so it's a real slow growth. But yeah, we're, we're up to 12 now. All right. And so what got you into the business in the first place? So I actually, my wife's in the other room. So if you see something thrown at me, I'm sorry. But uh, she, so happens. I dated a girl years ago whose father was into the roll-offs um, and he wanted to sell us the business. He had about 25 cans and two trucks. I knew it yep. wasn't going to work out with her. So I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, ship shape. I mean, dodge the bullet, yeah. got the lesson. No big deal. Exactly. Exactly. So that that's just been on the back of my mind since then. And I mean, now like roughly 15 years later, I said, you know what, I got to, you know, shit or get off the pot. So I got a small loan, got a truck and I think seven cans to start with and just kind of been, I, I plan on doing it nights and weekends, um, being that I work 50 hours a week. And then luckily, as soon as I got the equipment, my father said, Hey, I'll run for you. I'm retired. So he's been running the truck ever since I just do, uh, you know, the logistics pretty much the back end. All right. Yep. And who, who are your primary customers? Mostly residential. Um, I try to stay away from commercial at this point because I don't have enough cans to support it. They want to hang on to them for a month, two months at a time. And yep. I'm not going to make any money doing that. So mostly residential. And then with that, do you give your, what, what are your terms for your residential clients? Do you have a, a tonnage or a, a, a time? What does that look like? Yeah. So for instance, with the 10 yard, just for easy math, um, the 10 yard I charge right now, I charge 405 for that. And that, that includes one ton of waste in that price. Um, in a seven day rental term, we are going up on our prices here probably in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to go to 14 day rentals because I just, I'm not appeasing people with the seven days. So I got to bump mm. it up. That's pretty so much just, where we're at. Gotcha. So it'll be 14 days and yet you're going to add on, you know, 30 bucks a can or whatever for, because you can't, you're yeah. not be able to turn them as often. Yeah. 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 I mean, much. and that, you know, the nice thing is, you know, for, for a lot of guys out there, they struggle with fixed versus variable costs. And your your model is very simple because your dumpsters have a fixed cost. It costs you so much to have those dumpsters. And it's your dumpsters are no different than tables in a restaurant. You're paying for that square footage. And when you have one dumpster that sits for five days, another dumpster sits for five, 15 days, right? One is inherently worth three times as much as the other one because mm -hmm. it's, it's constantly churned and you only get paid when that dumpster is being dropped off or really delivered, I guess it's or, or dropped off or picked up one of the two times you're getting paid, whichever, well, however you recognize the revenue, right? Um, yep. you, you don't get, it does not, you don't get paid to have it sit there. And that yeah. is, that is a, uh, you know, that that's where having a bunch of dumpsters that are sitting, like you said, commercial work where they got to sit for 30 days. You got to have a, such a high volume of dumpsters that can sit because now you have a fixed asset. It's still depreciate at the same Right, right. It's only going to last you eight years or ten years, however long a dumpster lasts, and yet it's it's sitting there. And this is what one thing when guys often ask us, like, "Hey, is it better to have more trucks or less trucks?" Or like, "Well, it, how often are you using them?" Right. You got to. The goal is to have the right amount of equipment for today and tomorrow. You know, not ten years yep. from now, because then then all the only because the only thing that's going to cost you is is money, right? Because insurance and these other things go away every month, regardless if you use the equipment mm -hmm. or not. Exactly. Yeah. So what brings you on the program? What can we, what can whatever case I say, we at this point, what can me, what can I help you with? 
So yeah, naturally with dumpster rental, uh, junk removal kind of fell right into right into place um, without even advertising. Not a lot of it. I did a lot of you know odd jobs, little stuff, um, little demo jobs, um, and then so I wasn't really the dumpster company wasn't really growing like I wanted it to. So I had a lot of customers say, "Hey, do you do residential curbside pickups?" So I I, I pushed them off so much, and now I, I figured I'd start that to try to get some you know steady monthly income. Uh, so yep. we. We just started up the uh, the curbside. Oh, there, and, oh, there he is. <laughs> He's just making noise. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we so we started up the curbside, um, trying to grow that to a couple hundred customers. I still work full time, and I want to quit really bad. Um, so I'm hoping if I can get a couple hundred curbside customers, I'll be able to quit my job. And ever since watching your podcast, because I I did the YouTube University for a while and whatever, a bunch of you know yes and no's on there. But watching your podcast really made me want to get into the junk removal uh, pretty heavy and make it kind of more of like the uh, the first line. So that's why I figured I'd jump on. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you get a chance to catch our live episode last week? I missed the live. I watched the week before, but I don't think I saw the last week. So last week, it's interesting. A guy started with basically 20 accounts curbside, for, for lack of a better term. $5. Five dollars a week for twenty yeah. accounts. That's how he started, and now he has five hundred sixty accounts, and he does curbside, which is now turned into junk removal. And he's like, "I make more money doing junk removal." So he his his hillbilly mouth was simple: Monday through Thursday, I bang cans. Friday, Saturday, I'm I'm doing junk removal. Sunday, I do paperwork. Like it, it, it yeah. that was his. You know, this is where people are like, "Oh, you got to kill yourself, work eighty hours a week." It's like, no, you can like in him. He wasn't like. He was like, give me, we, we had him on the podcast on a Monday afternoon and he had, he's like, yeah, all right, I'll just get done early and, you know, be on the podcast. So it, it can be done. It just, you, you, um, whether it's curbside can pick up junk removal, dumpsters, don't matter. You get to decide as the uh, owner of the company when and where and how you work. The challenge is, you know, when you first start, you want to say yes to everybody for everything. And all, then, then your company, then your customers might as well run your company. You know, a lot of people want to get into yeah. um, junk removal or they want to get into, um, uh, what do you call it? Business, whether it's junk or not, because they don't want to have a boss. And it's like, well, when you get into any uh, industry, you have a lot of bosses. They're called customers. <laughs> and when you just when you let them oh, dictate your business, direction sometimes too. Oh yeah, yeah, the they yeah. Provides right. Oh yeah. <laughs> Anyways, for those of you guys listening, uh, Facebook, we're having an issue with Facebook, so it's not. No, we had an issue with my last live show. Facebook is not playing well with uh and down it's been doing really bad yeah it's not playing well so anyway so we won't we might not have any uh, uh comments or guests or watchers this week and you know what that's all right we're gonna keep we're gonna drive on you know casey was late facebook's down you know what we're still trucking that's what we do we control the narrative around here not the other way around casey bubba lawrence sure. joining us from the great state of texas wearing his mick shirt from was that last year or did you go this year did you end up going to mick this year i did not go this year same here. All right. The Mick, the Military Influencers Conference, unofficial sponsor, uh, and Jobber. Look at this. I wore my Jobber t shirt. That's when you know the laundry is getting a little light, a little light on the laundry. Uh, I did. I actually went deer hunting this weekend. So I ended up uh, doing laundry late last night, but I already pulled this t shirt out. I was like, fuck it. Doing the shows tomorrow. Hey, I'm going to rock my Jobber shirt. Another unofficial sponsor, Gronk, the Gronk Brothers. Why? Shaker. Why would you do that? that? Was that the one that was on uh, Shark Tank? Yeah, yeah. Chris is actually we're actually good friends. Oh, yeah. He lives like ten minutes away. Oh yeah, I so say you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were hanging out with the Gronks. Uh, man, we got a lot of sponsors. I mean, they don't give us any dollars except for Jobber. Jobber will throw me a few bones uh, when you sign up for Jobber and use the code uh, getjobber.com backslash Camel Crew Junk Removal. Just Google it; you'll figure it out. Otherwise, Taylor can drop in the link somewhere. Taylor's a pretty smart guy. Um, all right, so I'll get Casey caught up real quick. Adam is, got in the dumpster business. Got twelve cans out there. Dad runs the truck, wants to get in full time, starts dabbling in junk removal. Uh, and then my question to him was, what can we do for you? So I guess, Adam, let's use this as a, we haven't done a really good console in a while. Mm. You know, <laughs> like, like we did we, we did with uh, well, we had Tracy. Two Tracy was dope. Questions on our last episode that came in after, right? Were there? But that's the thing is I want to I get to those questions later on in this episode to answer for the, for him. I forget. I think his name's Zach. But yeah, they come in pretty much after, I think. Oh, oh, so someone listened afterwards and then had a question. Oh, you're saying questions for Zach or questions for us? No, it was questions for us from episode 83. 
Well, let's, do, let's and, do this right now. That'll be our segue. Let's just do it right now, Casey. That, okay. That we'll warm up Adam. So we, yeah, let's just do that. He might be able to chime so, in. Two questions from Zach Darrow. Okay. There's one for Andy, one for Casey. Oh, one for okay. Andy. <clears throat> Could you do a deep dive into a PL statement and see if there are certain expenses that could be reduced to increase profit? Yes. And number yeah, two yeah. for Casey. <laughs> there, there, there was, uh, yes, yes. Can I? Yes. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> and, yeah. Number I'll two for Casey. That. I'll jump on that. I'd like to hear more about your journey doing strictly demolition. That's interesting. That's, yeah, those are, I, I mean, those are, those are questions, but that's uh, fine. This, well, this was also the episode yeah. caring for winter and beyond. Okay. That's fair. Uh, maybe we do a full on fucking, you know. Here, actually, here's what here's what I said. Here's here's what I will say. Uh, I need a guest. I need a guest that can send me a PNL. Um, because my numbers are, are my, I know what my numbers are, right? And if I just say, hey, this is my numbers, like give me. Actually, I got a, a right right away junk removal. My buddy, he texts me every now and then. He helped me. He helped me out this morning. Actually, he said, hey, can you take a look at my my PNL? Whether it's him, so I already have a copy of his PNL. I would. Here's the deal. I will do a free. Um, live PL assessment with any one of our listeners. Uh, what I require is at least uh, two years of data and broken down quarterly. I would love monthly, however, quarterly I can work with quarterly. I will do a live PL scrub right here. I, I would like, I need them ahead of time so at least I know what I'm going to talk about, but then I will go top to bottom everything I can say to answer your question immediately. Here's, here's the hillbilly math your top three variable expenses the thing you can do today to impact your bottom line top three variable expenses in this order labor variable rate labor Mm -hmm. when you have employees second one in our industry disposal cost disposal cost is equivalent to supplies or equivalent to raw goods if you are a manufacturer right disposal cost is a thing that is unique to our industry and is the cost of doing business when we do things that's it and then the third one is fuel because we are a mobile operation. So well, those are your let me top add one in there. Oh, what's that? If you are a franchise and you don't <laughs> have your royalties in your P and L, oh yeah, you are fucked up. Well, no, 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 no. Those are these are variable. No, 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 no. These are variable. I'm gonna get a, now. I'm gonna get to fixed. Now I'm gonna get to fixed. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. If you have a fixed rate, r- r- yeah, because that comes off the fucking bottom. Let's not even talk about royalties. Because you know what? Uh, whatever. Franchises. Well, they some go royalties away. are variables. Some, some are. No, no, they're, they're they're variable rate, but you can't do anything about them. And actually, the more right. jobs you do, they go away. So that's what I'm saying with royalties. It, it doesn't apply to enough people to make the argument. Um, here are your here are your top three fixed expenses when you have a more viable business, right? When you're doing it on your backyard, these things may not apply. However, mm-hmm. top three, depending on where things sit, is salaries. Right, including your own. So salaried labor is, is, is going to be up there. Second one is going to be rent for your facility. Third one is going to be um your trucks that you have some control over. Now, the other yeah. one, the other big one that comes in there is insurance. The reason why I'm not going to spend time talking about insurance is because you shop the rates, you get the rate, that's it. Right. With trucks, you could be like, Hey, I, I got two trucks with you know 700 hour a month truck payments, but if I bought one truck that was a thousand dollars a month. I can do everything I need to do because I don't need the capacity. I need the versatility, for example. That's just a, right? Or like the guy last week was interesting. What was that guy's name? I want to say it was Mac. I don't think it was Mac. Uh, good fucking dude. But dude had like seven Alex. trucks. Alex? Oh, yeah. I fucking love that guy. He's like, well, he literally bought a truck to flip it, and then it didn't work out, and then turned it into a fucking kick-ass junk removal company. It's like, and then he had a plan. And a truck for trash cans. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then that same truck ended up trading for trash cans. Fucking... I'm like, this is why I tell people, right? Like, actually, you said something earlier, Adam. You said, I hope. And hope is not a fucking plan. I read about <laughs> it in my book. It's better to have a plan that goes to shit than a hope of a result, right? You're like, this guy straight up had a, it was a shit plan. He even said it was a shit plan. He's like, yeah, I bought a truck, and it turns out it was shit, and I couldn't sell it for even what I paid for it. So I started hauling trash with it because, fuck, it was already there. It's like, that was a terrible plan. And yet... He is moderately successful. He is a small business owner. He quit his fucking job, and now he's bringing a guy on. So you know what? His plan was his plan was shit, and God was he successful. I I uh, man, he was a good guest too, because he was honest. I, you know, often we get people. I, I especially get this whether it's junk or otherwise. They come on this program, or or I meet him in real life, and they tell me all the wins they had. This guy was like, let me tell you how I fucked up. Let me tell you where I screwed up. 
let me tell you how this didn't work out for me. And it was like, yeah, he, he said all the things that most people always say to themselves. Anyways, it was a good show. And then Casey, to your question about diving deeper in a demo, that we don't, we can do a whole episode on that. You know, we've never had a demo contractor on like a no shit. That's all they do person. Well, we, we had that one guy who was moving from Tracy. No, he was moving from, I think, Minnesota or Montana to Washington state. Cause of his Oh, mom. cause a girlfriend. And he was going to, he was going to open up a new junk rule business in yeah. Washington. And I was like, let's do a quick Google search. And we like did a quick Google search of his area. And it was like, Everyone had a jump rule. Sa- saturated. And I'm like, and you kick ass at yeah. demo. He's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, you should stick with that. Stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. But he, that was a, yeah, that was a commercial demo. I, I, that guy was fucking dope. That was like a cool dude too. Damn. I can get my, my, my old sub who took over my, my client list. I can get him on. That'd be interesting. That's all he's doing now is residential structural demolition. All right. Well, now we have a guest on Adam and we, we filibustered enough for you to come up with some questions. What do you guess <laughs> for us? Oh. I got nothing. Nothing. Got nothing oh, as yeah, no, I got no. I was saying you better, you better have something, otherwise this is gonna be you. You just <laughs> listen to Casey and I bullshit for forty five more minutes. <laughs> no, what um, part? just to piggyback off what Casey said or or that that other uh, commenter, I'm interested in the demo thing. So we, hmm. so I work with a lot of good operators. Um, and when I get a job, you know, we've done some small demos, cabins, uh, stuff like that. And I love that. I think it's great. I don't know much about it. I seem to come out on my pricing. I want to say it's like a lucky thing. We do pretty good with that. So I'm I'm def- interested in the whole episode of uh, of demo. I, I really like that. And mm-hmm. honestly, so I'm pretty rural around here, and I see more of almost like a special uh, Western Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm in, did, I'm in Wade, North. Wade Rivers. Wade Rivers lived out that way, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yes, I think. You so. know him? You know? Do you know Wade? No. No. Shout out Wade. Because um, he wasn't. Well, I guess then again, I, I this is how ignorant I am. Never been. To, I didn't mean to cut you off, Adam. I'm sorry. No, 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 I, no. I'm Northeast. But I think of uh, Massachusetts as Boston, and then everything else is Western Massachusetts. Like, right? Like, <laughs> dude, but, like, but that's it, right? Like, there's not like a. I'm in Central Massachusetts. Like, it's not that big of a fucking place. You know, yeah, no, even Central Mass is is Boston, pretty much. You know, okay, okay, so okay, so. You're Boston or bust. Like, that's it. Like, those are your options. Okay. So he was a yeah, not Westfield. Boston guy. Westfield. Right? Westfield. He lives in Westfield. Westfield's Westfield? about an hour from me. And it's it's Westfield. pretty concentrated. He's probably got good luck out there. Well, he was part of a not shitty luck. franchise. Yeah, not yeah. luck. And, and he was part of a shitty franchise. Now. Great dude. Yeah. Air Force guy. Anyways. All right. I digress. You want to learn about demo? You've got some good contract or good operators. Yeah, so I just I just kind of pay my buddies cash to help me out because I mean I can't hire anybody right now. I'm, I don't know how far I'm I am from that, but uh, yeah, we land a lot. Of, so it's so rural out here. Like the the quarter half, three quarter full trailer load stuff is I think less common where I am, and it's more like hey, rent a mini excavator and 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 just hold this place out. You know, uh, I get a lot more of that specialized type removal rather than just junk into a trailer. Um, so that's kind of what I want to really get into and, and more structural demo. Is is right. kind of a jam. That, that this is all well, Casey. I can sit back and learn because this is this is Casey. Actually, well, I got. I, I speaking of Casey, remember that house I asked you about like eight months ago, nine months ago was near a uh, a lake. I sent you a couple yeah. pictures. I'm like, hey, can you tear this down? You're like, yeah. Uh, they they called us last week and want to move forward with it. So so uh, we'll be eating some wings up at Spitfires on State. So yeah, the way I I'm you know down, how man. I tear this is how I tear this is how I tear houses down. Uh, I call Casey. I fly him up here. He tears the house down, crashes in my house for a few days. We go get wings, flies back to Texas, drop a little checky check in the mail. House tore down. I, I don't have to look at the house. I just oh, see the yes. hole afterwards. Check that the old wings. So, so the good thing about demolition, I'll tell you this right now, is you know a lot of people get intimidated by it because yeah, when you go knock a house down, there's a lot of moving parts, not just the machines, but how does it fall? When it does fall, what are you going to find? If there's a basement and you didn't know about it, that's an issue too. And I know up north they have basements. Down here they don't. Mm-hmm. We have storm shelters. We have septic. Um, you'll also be surprised to know that sometimes septic tanks were put in by the owner previous down the road. Didn't tell anyone. Still have city sewer hooked up to the house. You'll cap that off. And then one of your machines decides to cave into the ground and it smells like shit. Well, it's because they found a septic system. Um 
so I tell you this because it, it wasn't just a jump in and see what happens kind of thing for me. Um, I took a year, about a year to really figure out how to do demolition, bigger demolition than like a kitchen, right? I want to know how to knock a house down and how can I do it successfully and efficiently to keep doing it. But I also remembered I was a junk removal company, not a demolition company. So it really helped that I could not have to rely solely on demo projects because at the time, you know, I probably had 13, maybe the most in one year when I was junk removal. Well, obviously you can't rely on that um, for a whole year. So when I went into full scale demolition, it was no longer profitable for me to do interior demolition. Mm -hmm. That's why I stuck to straight structural demolition because for me, I didn't have a bunch of employees anymore. I only had one sub and I had another sub that I could use and he had his own equipment. So that really helped. Now, what I tell people is if you're new to demo and you really want to get into it, interior demolition is the best because the profit margin is way, way more than structural demolition. Yeah. Um, I was probably averaging on a good day, 25% margins on structural demolition. On a bad day, I broke even. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interior demolition though, average 75, 80% profit margin because you're only touching it very limited you're you're not let's say you go in there you knock a, a wall down like you're knocking it down and when it's on the ground you clean it up put it in your trailer it's done with you don't have to touch it anymore same thing with the trash also interior work when you're not knocking down the frame of a house you have two guys in there just banging it out one guy cleaning up you can get in and out for your most average i guess kitchen or bathroom project in a few hours you can go in there and be done with it and make over a grant with about two, maybe a third person. Yeah. Um, and you can load yourself up with those. So for instance, if I was like, hey, we're gonna do a whole kitchen demolition with cabinets and let's just say an island, right? That's about a quarter trailer of debris. That's it. Yeah. It's not that much. So I can probably get four, maybe five of those same projects in a day with the same crew. If I really, if it came out, if it came out that way, right? Yeah. So when you're out there and you're looking at these houses, I'm not sure where you live. You said it's rural. Yeah. But I will, very. I will, I'll take a shot in the dark and guess there's probably a, a lot of old barns, horse stables, stuff like that. Maybe that the weather got to them and oh, yeah. just an eyesore. Yeah. yeah. Well, the cool thing about that is most of the time it's two very common products, lumber and steel. Yeah. So you can go out there and this is my favorite kind of demo. When you're in the rural area, you have very little or very, uh, you have a lot of room for error. What I mean by that is if it falls wrong, nine times out of 10, you're not close to a house. So it's not going to hit something. It's just going to fall wrong. Yeah. Right. So that's the best way to start is in the middle of a, of a freaking pasture. But also, um, depending on how, I, I don't know how it is in Massachusetts, but here, depending on the, on the time of year, if it's strictly lumber, a lot of times the owner will be able to burn it. Yeah, I'll just oh, burn yeah. the lumber. And then that steel you're hauling off, you can recycle it. And the cool thing is you're still charging for everything. Yeah. So a lot of times in junk removal, Andy can probably back me up on this. Everybody wants to do everything. They want to mm -hmm. haul everything away. They want to touch everything. I started realizing it. I'd rather just get paid for my labor if, if mm -hmm. that was a, an opportunity for me. So if someone's like, hey, I need this taken care of. I'm going to get rid of everything myself, but I'm going to pay you labor. It's perfect for me because now I don't have to tie up a truck and trailer. I can just send out two guys or three guys, get a machine, get paid my labor rate, which is a huge profit margin comparatively mm -hmm. to junk removal, and then move on to the next job. Yeah. Well, demolition's yeah. similar. Yeah, I got I got a I got a project coming up uh, week after next. Uh, it's two thousand yeah. tires, and yeah. I'm not tr I'm not trucking them because my little sixteen cubic yard. I mean, my dump trailers are twenty four cubic yards. Um, mm -hmm. I ain't I ain't messing around with that. I'm gonna load up 53s, 53 foot semis. Probably fit about or or 40 tires in yours. Yeah, probably. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So or it's two 53 foot semis, right? Or mm -hmm. or it's you know 20 30 yarders basically, where the material, right? So it's like what are you know what are my choices here? And it's like all right, let's 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 to Casey's point, let's get paid on the labor end. Now I got the job because yeah. I'm a junk removal company. It still falls under junk removal, and yet I'm not playing all these other fuck fuck games i'm just gonna you know get rid of get rid of the tires that is that is the goal 
Um, to Casey's point, too, uh, we do almost exclusively residential interior demos. And I've done it all. I've torn down sheds, garages, barns. Um, we used to do commercial work. Commercial work was the least profitable with the highest complaints and mm -hmm. the, the highest, highest issue. liability. Highest liability by a yeah. lot. And so, mm -hmm. and we lost our asses on a couple uh, commercial demos. It's like you peeled off the floor or you pulled off the carpet and, the, and you know, what I consider to be a clean working surface and somebody else's is different. So now we're sitting there dealing with epoxy. I don't, I don't mess with it. Um, yeah. We actually did, we did a commercial demo. We wrapped it up today. It was a two day job. It's for a contractor we know. And we did the removal. So it was like, yep, it made sense. It was the right space. And it was steel studded um, interior walls with drop ceiling. And then, car and, and uh, I don't know, we did, I, don't, I think we left the flooring, but it's like something like that. It makes sense. Or if we pulled the carpet, they're putting a new carpet down. Right. So they just right go, go over that shit again. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are, um, there are times where I'm like, yeah, that does make sense to do it. And we had a, a we had a barn or a garage we took down a couple months back because it was fired out. And to Casey's point, this one, it was in an alley, but it had room to fall kind of anywhere. Like we could have, again, we reduced the liabilities. Now, I had another one was a three story house that burned up. And they're like, hey, will you nail, take this thing down? We're like, absolutely not. Not even, not, we're not even going to entertain it. We're like, well, the restoration company wants to charge us this amount of money. I'm like, cool. I, I, I don't know if that's good. Like, I don't like to me, I'm like, sounds like a plan. No, uh, we cut our teeth and make our money on basically, f I'll call it four areas um, for us, which I guess maybe bathrooms are basically the same thing. But I look at master baths significantly different than like a powder mm -hmm. room because, the, the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> typically your first floor baths are going to be a half bath, their first floor, no stairs, no tub. Right. So like that's mm -hmm. almost a category of its own. That's typically a half day job. Kitchens, if it's cabinets only, another to Casey's point, if it's cabinets in an island, you know, it's maybe a quarter day job. Once you start in flooring and, and then some walls, it's a full day job. And then yep. uh, master baths are anywhere from one to three days, depending on when they were constructed. If it's the last 40 years, fuck, it's a one day job. If it's 100 years ago, there's so many other variables, lath and plaster and mortar. And what you yeah. got to figure out with that is you got to figure out how the houses were built. And then the fourth area yeah. for us is uh, basements. We get we have basements here, so we have a lot of rec rooms where people put up shitty paneling, carpet. You know, it's got that musty smell to it, and that's like a fuck a one hour, two hour job. The nice thing about that are those jobs, in particular in the basements, it's like it's a super low risk. It's paneling, so it comes out pretty quick, and it ends up sometimes it's paneling, and then also we'll take out the walls if the two by fours are rotted or moldy or stinky, or they just want to open up the space entirely before they sell. The nice thing is, like I said, it's a low risk. There's little chance of like uh, water or gas. You got to work around electrical a little bit. And and the third thing is, it has this high impact that we're awesome, right? People are like, oh my god, you open up the space so much, right? Like that makes a huge difference for people. So like, there's that. And I guess the fifth category is we still do some of those outbuildings. Like we love taking down sheds, like eight by twelve sheds. Yeah. You know, like they they last twenty years. You take the roofs off, you fell them into themselves. In a perfect world, especially when you're more rural, you back your trailer right next to it. Like, so mm -hmm. when Casey said, like, hey, worst case scenario, it falls the wrong way. And it's like, yeah, you got to carry it another 10 feet versus yeah, falling in your trailer or near your trailer. Yeah. And that's the question. Can you move your trailer to where it fell? Right. I mean, so yeah. that's that is where in demos, like start with sheds and powder rooms. And one thing I uh, it, now we almost never do demos for homeowners. We only do it basically for general contractors when it comes to kitchen and the baths. And we work with realtors when it comes to like basements and stuff. And the reason is yeah. homeowners don't always know what they want. I don't trust a homeowner that says they're going to turn off their own water or power because yeah. they don't know what they're doing. And and I'm not taking that liability. We actually yeah, I was going to say that as yeah. We I are, always we are use kicked at a, my electrician. Yeah. Yep. We are asses kicked at a kitchen two weeks ago, four weeks ago, because the water line on the fridge wasn't disconnected and our guys pulled it out, popped the line. And, and now we were fucking replacing drywall in the basement and had to mud it and sand it and paint it. And you have a customer that didn't want us there doing those things. Right. Like that's the kind of stuff you want to avoid is you want to reduce all the liability. And when you have a, if you have a contractor or a homeowner, that's like, Oh, I want you to turn off the water and power. Like, I don't care. Be like, cool. I oh. do. <laughs> Same with hot yeah. tubs. If I show yeah. up to a hot tub, it's got, you know, if it has water in it, I can work around it. If it's still collect, connected to the, the electrical, I'm not interested in doing it. I'll walk, I'll walk, lose the 50 bucks it took me to show up, 
versus someone getting hurt or or a house fire or something you know real bad happening yeah I've, adam have you had any requests for any kind of demolition or have you had have you been exposed to those types of possible leads is that why you're kind of wondering yeah so i mean a lot of them come with property cleanouts like i'm talking like 100 acre property you know something that's been mm-hmm. alone forever party spots oh, you know those. Those. Yeah, they're awesome. Those are my favorite ones. And I, I make good money doing them. I've only done a handful, but they've all they've all paid out huge. And I mean, there's little cabins. So just like we're saying, you're in the middle of the woods. You you can't hurt anything besides yourself or the equipment. Um, and like I said, I hire my buddy from work that who he's on my crew uh, every day. Amazing operator. So we've done a lot of those little cabins, sheds, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I kind of want to I'd love to get into like little little ranch houses, stuff like that. I mean, that's a whole other ball game with permitting and all that stuff. I understand that. But so yeah, I do, we, I do. I understand Massachusetts is very strict when it comes to permitting. Oh yeah. Um, and I will say, if you, I don't know how close you are to the more suburbia area, but one thing also to consider is to partner up with your code enforcement, because mm-hmm. we had we kind of had like a sub rural area by us and it was just growing quickly to the point where you have these older properties that were just disgusting tons of crap out there and code enforcement would come in and it'd be the point like hey we have to now pay to get this cleaned up because we've we've ticketed and we find we've notified this this person so many times now we have to make this decision and we come in there and they set it up for us they have a cop they have a police officer there they have all the right personnel to be there they get all the paperwork that's needed legally. We come in, we clean up, um, do our portion of it, and then we're gone. And we have no customer interaction. Um, sometimes there'll be a customer who's angry. Like one time in the beginning, I got I got pulled out on, uh, someone pulled a gun on me. <laughs> um, it was our first like really big code enforcement job. It was me and like six of my guys. And I was on the back porch and the guy came out with a gun right at me because I was the only one on the porch. But, you know, he was just upset. But those are good opportunities because the code enforcement of the city or town, they have a budget that they can use. So a lot of times they'll say, hey, look, can you give us a bid on this? And if you have a good relationship with them, A, they won't get other bids because they just need to get it done and they know you. Or B, they'll say, hey, I'm going to get two other bids. All right. I need at least get three bids total. So please give me an estimate. And I always tell them, here's my bottom and here's my high. Because I want them to understand if they get two other bids, I want him to come back to me and say, which one is it? Because if I have last say, I have more opportunity, right? Um, But those actually probably worked with the same code enforcement. There's There's a town called Hazlitt down here. I probably maybe more than 10 times a year, I would do code enforcement jobs just for them. Yeah. so those are opportunities, right? And when it comes to demo, like like what you said, you do these property cleanups where there's a bunch of crap out in the fields or a cabin or whatever. The cool thing is, this is how I started. I would rent uh, like a skid steer, whatever, any kind of equipment. And if I thought the job was going to be a two-day job, I would rent it for a week. Okay. Yeah. I would build that price into my pricing for that job. That way it's paid for. Now I have an extra four to five days, maybe even the weekend with this machine because they usually go off of hours. So then what I'll do is I'll try to get another job for that machine because now it's paid for. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of these rental companies, they will charge you like 75 bucks to move the machine. That's it. So you, you, well you can't even it. move it yourself. It's worth it. How do you think Andy saw my yard? I had an acre yard. And I put down crushed asphalt road base for the whole yard. And I used this big 50,000 pound excavator. And everybody's like, oh, well, you just had one. I'm like, no, I pulled it off a job. I paid 150 bucks to get it moved to my yard because it was sitting on a job that had had a brief pause. I had it to my yard, did all the work I needed to. And then I paid another 150 bucks to move it back to the job site. So I pretty much spent 300 bucks to use that excavator in my yard. So if that was a job, that would have been three hundred dollars to use on a job that I'm probably charging five grand for, for just that yep. machine. Yep. You know, I've done that a couple times. We so I got a 
rental company out here who's he's a pretty good buddy of mine, the owner. So we get pretty much anything up to like a 307 cat. Um, and I try okay. to do that. I try to throw in a couple days in a job. And then we have 97 acres up here in Northfield. So there's always work to do here, uh, clean up, because I'm a pack rat as well. My wife hates me for it. But like on the recycling end, I, I just brought, I just tore down a silo the other day and all the metal hooping around it, I took home. It looks like shit in the yard. But then I just, you know, I bring home an excavator for a day, throw it in dumpsters, cash it in or whatever. So that's it's like Andy's playground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Someday. I live. Yeah, no, I, uh, the thing is at my house, I, I, I don't have shit because I, I live, uh, I don't know, I'm not saying modestly. I, I have tons of shit in here though. Oh yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Well, the first house. The first house. Um, um where you were the pianos. That, that was an, un, that was another incident. We had, I had a one and a third acre. And at one point when we had to finally leave that house, they're like, we gotta get rid of the wood pile. We're like, ah, oh, just get a 40 yarder. Uh, three forty dollars later, because the wood pile just, yeah. Oh man, I had I had I was the guy that Department of Neighborhood Services was coming after, because I'm like, oh, I'll just take care of it later, right? Actually, I told that joke. I was telling that joke yesterday. I play when I play volleyball, I tore up my rotator cup. Is it is it your rotator cup or cuff? Cuff with two. Fs. It is cuff. See, that's weird. I always want to say it. cup, rotator cup. Anyways, I tore up my rotator cuff like three weeks ago, and it's starting to get a little bit better now. And uh, I was joking with my girlfriend. I was like, yeah, if fucking shoulder hurts, I won't be able to sleep on it tonight, you know, after volleyball. She's like, uh, why do you keep doing that to yourself? I'm like, well, it's tomorrow's problem. Today was awesome. I got to hit some volleyballs, right? And that's okay. drunk removal. It's like, it's it's our, uh, or like when uh, Homer Simpson, he's like, we had a variable rate uh, home loan. And they're just like, yeah, you're going to pay this off in the future. He's like, this isn't the future. This is the now. Like the future is this magical place that happens in the distance. And the problem with junk rule guys or people that have this knack is everything seems like a good idea, right? Put in the back 40 and then it's got value, but every second it sits there, it loses value. So yeah. I live on a farm now and my dad has, the whole reason we bought the farm was because originally I was going to clean it out. And then instead I just told him I'd buy it as is. We cleaned it out entirely. And then my dad proceeded to fill all the space with his stuff now. So <laughs> eventually I will have to, uh, uh, adjust that and uh not me my warehouse people are surprised how clean our warehouse is because we are constantly churning because there's no emotional attachment to shit um now no. once it makes it in the conference room like i found this dope ass fucking uh milk jug today when i was walking in the warehouse now it's in the conference room now there's an emotional attachment it's fucking awesome <laughs> everything else in the warehouse is everything else in the warehouse has got to go you know we got to churn it and that's that's where the downsides i see in this business and it's one of the things I saw 15 years ago when I was first getting in. I uh, was interviewing for a job with this company that did, I don't know, it's home cleanouts. And they had probably a 12-foot trailer told behind the pickup truck, did it on nights and weekends. And um, they took me to their storage unit, and they had a storage unit that had all these knickknacks and shit, precious moments and stuff, I remember. And they're like, oh, this stuff has value. It's like $20 here, $30 there. And they were like asking me for consulting advice. I'm like, well, how much are you paying for the storage unit? They're like $250 a month. I go, well, how often do you have sales? They're like, oh, we haven't had one in two months. I'm like, okay. What, 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 well, even then I was like, why don't you just donate it? You know, that is one of the downsides with junk removal. It's like, you, you, when you, Casey talked about this earlier, you got to be disciplined about, about, about what business you're in, right? If you're in the dumpster rental business, that's the business you're in. If you're in junk removal or you're in demolition, that's the business you're in. It is very, very easy to get distracted by these other things that are next to you. And that's why I even say with demo, it's like the big companies I see that do demo, they run tight fucking thin profit margins because they have yeah. to win so many fucking jobs. Like, and that's how I'm in junk roll. I, I, I got, we got seven, seven, 17, 18 guys on payroll right now. You know, it's you know, mid November coming into the, the winter here, 17 guys on payroll, 11 trucks. Like I have to churn it, right? My profit margin shrinks because I have to book jobs. So yeah. Chuck in a truck can underbid me because he doesn't have to get the, the price that I get. Because I have, yeah. you know, we're talking about variable versus fixed expenses. I have very high fixed expenses. You know, 20,000 square foot, 11 trucks, a couple salaried employees. And that's the thing with demo. It's like the guys that are small, they're the ones that have the higher profit margin. So for us, we have a small demo division within our larger company. And that's how we stay where we need to stay. Yep. We basically have three divisions within our company. And we'll do, yeah. We'll do what we do in residential trunk removal every year because that's so our, our core business 
and the other businesses are well defined and we don't do we don't mess around with stuff that doesn't fit like moving man that i don't, i don't like doing it well because i did it for years and the the the, the junk removal franchise uh that closed here in our area recently they had been doing moving and junk removal and auctions and resale it's like oh like it's a lot and it, it, it's a lot to it's it's difficult to master all of them right like they talk about 10,000 hours to mastery that, that takes a long ass time right five years yeah. if you're doing it eight hours a day so yeah. how are you going to master four different businesses you know yeah i think that's, that's my problem <laughs> yeah well I'm, I'm, I'm kind of starting to hear that right it's like well i got in the dumpsters well i picked up the scrap oh i turned on a shed i got a 97 acre farm i got a full-time job it's like you gotta you gotta pick oh. your lane and fucking go my 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 lane right now is quitting my job. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I want to quit tomorrow. I really do. My wife wants to kill me for saying. I, I mean, I, I work. For, I do construction. I'm union. I have amazing benefits. I make a bunch of money, and I'm so unhappy. I'm so miserable. So I'm I'm just trying to make something stick here, and that's kind of where the so, the residential came in the curbside because it's a fixed yeah. you know per customer monthly income. So I'm, I'm really trying to hit that home so I can quit and then do the junk removal demo thing you know harder that's that's my main goal dumpsters i don't care if dumpsters go away honestly but mm -hmm. i like having them around you know <laughs> so today i actually talked to a previous client who who i brought before he moved and you know he had some difficult time adjusting to the area he moved to well i talked to him today he was just hollering at me he's like oh yeah everything's good I, I'm, I'm still working full time i, I got a job but during the daytime, I'm working my business. Um, his hours, he works a night shift at, um, where I forgot what he said, but he works so at night shift. Tim Reeves? Yeah. Yeah, good dude. And he works a night shift, but in the daytime, he's working junk removal. But he's doing it because he, he actually realized at a certain point, he needs to take care of his family and his priorities. Yeah. Even if it means taking a job and having a boss temporarily, as well as supplementing the rest of it through uh, through junk removal. A lot of us think, you know, it's junk removal or bust, which is, hey, it's great, cool, whatever motivates you. But if you have a family and you have obligations and priorities, we've talked about this before. We talked about with Uber. Um, we, we had someone on who was like, yeah, I, I think he was doing Uber or something. And that's hustling, man. Hustling yep. isn't just being great at one thing. Hustling is making um, – making things work, figuring shit out on the go and not accepting one answer for, for, you know, for one thing. Hey, there's many ways of doing something. Well, there's also many ways of succeeding. There's many ways of paying your bills. I personally have a goal in the next five years, by the time I'm 40, I want to have 10 streams of revenue, 10 separate streams of revenue. That's my goal. Personally, um, I have three right now. Okay. For me, that's that's what makes me keep pushing forward. If you are doing junk removal right now, and let's say you are like in, in your your case, Adam, um, how long do you say you've been doing this? Uh, March twenty twenty one. I started, and it's kind of all mixed up since then. Well, one thing you can do is remember, and I know sometimes people like hearing this, junk removal is not a rural, um, it's not a rural industry. If yeah. you want to have a, a successful junk removal business, if you want to be a business owner in junk removal, it is very, very um, advantageous to do it in a very high populated area. Yeah. Because, yes, can you do it in rural area? Absolutely. But we know a guy who was stuck in a rural area in Pennsylvania. And to this mm. day, he is still in the driver's seat. And yeah. it's been like six, seven years. It's, it's because... There's a difference be between being a junk removal um, remover and a business owner, right? Right now, he is an owner operator of his of his franchise, um, and he's stuck. And he knew that, but he was in a situation that he 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 got himself in, and unfortunately, we get to that 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 point. Now, if you can find a niche in that rural community, right? Yeah. Maybe maybe that could be something you can kind of dive more into in the next coming years. Maybe you could be the go-to barn disappearer, right? Like, yep. I need my barn to disappear. I'm going to call Adam. I'm going to need all this land cleaned up because I'm building a new stable or whatever. Call Adam. Yeah. Um, 
So you always have to be, uh, I guess, evolving with the market. And, and in your case, you're in a rural area. So yep. keep up with what the what they're going to need. And and be and also in the same token, be respectful of what is a good fit for you. So one of the yeah. one of the uh, one of the clients I I consult with, um, they're located outside of Nashville, rural area, and they first got started. They started yes to all these equestrian projects, so they started doing all these barn projects, and they had a tractor because they had one, right? And they had a trailer because they used it for demo. And they're like, we really like doing it, and yet the money wasn't there, and the job, and we weren't mm -hmm. experts at it. It's like, could they do it? Yes. And so what they had to do is they now drive primarily like now when they do jobs in Nashville, they're like, yeah, it's worth it because we're getting paid top dollar. So it's like, yeah. It, and, and also for them, they're like, yeah, instead of working, you know, eight hour days, we're working 12 hour days, but we're also consolidating a five day project into four days and then taking a full oh. rest day or whatever it is. And so that that's the other thing. It's like when you're in a rural area, you, you either like the guy the other day we were talking to, um, it's like you're either everything, you know, you're everything to somebody, right? So then, so then your customer base is your defined. This is who I serve, and I'll do whatever they need, right? Like he, his whole thing was like, hey, I'm gonna be full service uh, garbage for these people. Do curbside. I'm gonna do junk removal. I can't remember if we talked about doing roll offs or maybe just dropping his dump trailer or letting people load it for him or load it themselves yeah. or something. But it's like his his thing was, I'll do whatever it takes. But this is the only geography I can handle, right? So you can yeah. you can have uh more services if you have extremely loyal customers so that is that yeah. is a caveat in a rural area now i've never had that before because i'm here you know my shot i can i can look and see the city of milwaukee you know from my, yeah. my my high rise second story building here um and uh so it's like i i i operate in like i know when i go wide on services and i'm already wide on who i serve I, you know my my population total service area is 1.5 million people like if I go wide on services, then then I'm nobody to everybody. So yeah. you could be some, you could be the guy. Um, the challenge is you can't have anything that's going to require a lot of skills because you're not exactly. going to have the, you're never going to have the paces. And and then also you gotta remember, as you scale this business, you got to bring guys in, and they already don't have the same skill sets you have. They don't have the relationships yep. you have, and so that is already problematic because whatever you teach them is going to be diluted to your customers. Yeah. So we have, guys, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you can also get picky and pick which, which is more profitable, which you enjoy doing more. Um, if I told you, Hey, Andy, you know, would you rather do what you're doing now with junk removal? Or what if I could guarantee you to walk away with $10,000 in profit every week, and you only had to work maybe two or three days. It's a guarantee. Like, it's a, um, it depends what it is. Yeah. It depends. Oh, I can go get a fucking job. I don't want a goddamn job. I'll tell you that much. No, uh, what I'm saying is, yeah, something like, like what you were doing with the with the property cleanups, right? I mean, those are two oh, yeah. two day jobs. Sometimes you walk away with a pretty good profit. Yeah. It doesn't oh, it yeah. doesn't take up all your time. No. Um, and I like those companies. Well, so that's those right. awesome options. Yeah, that's why we have yeah. our industrial division where we do projects throughout mm -hmm. the Midwest. Um, yeah. because that's what I really, really enjoy. And it's pretty profitable. Now, what is it not? It's not consistent, right? I mean, yeah. K Case and I often talk about the McDonald's project we did because basically for 60 days, we were running and gunning and traveling. It was two months of our life. And yet it felt like five years because it was, it was a, we put some fucking hours in, you know, like Casey and I never had an issue together. And then we worked together and we could probably work together fine, but that project there was a lot of it was a, it was a hell of a way to have your first project you know like we had never worked together before well, that. it was it was a great experience oh, that yeah. us uh i think it taught us a lot of uh, of our different attributes right oh, yeah. our attributes yeah. but at the same time we both were exposed to something that we'd never been exposed to before and yeah. It's one of those things where we talked about if it happened again would we do it yeah he may say no but i'm gonna tear it out I'm sure he'd be like, yeah, let's do that again. Oh, 100% do it again. I would 100% do it again. Like, okay. Oh, I don't and know. I, I would say I, no. I, I make right. it, yeah, make it more fucked up this time. I don't give a shit. Like, here's the deal. I, I will say. Much, I, I don't care how much we very, fight. Yeah, I don't care how much yeah. we fight. Here, here's the, two things I know. I'm in charge. And we'll figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> like, that's well, why it, it worked it, for me. If it was the other way, if Casey was in charge, 
results may, may, may vary. I don't know. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a being told kind of guy. I'm not a, not a huge fan. Adam, it was, I'll, I'll sum it up, Adam. In two months, we became an expert <laughs> in such a niche thing that it will never happen again. And we'll never be able to use those skills. Again. <laughs> yeah, there was zero. Yeah. And yeah. Oh yeah. 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 No, we are really good at doing something that did it in, in the grand scheme of life. Didn't matter. No. Um, also, I never knew that you could have an employee, uh, or employee is a loose term, a 1099 guy fly from Texas to California to leave the hotel, fly back to fly back to uh, Texas, and then ask you to pay for his airfare on the way back, all in the same 12 hour period. It was LA, oh, it was Los Angeles. <laughs> that's what I said. I said California, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Dallas to yeah. LA. He flew in Sunday night and he flew out Monday mm-hmm. morning. And got mad when I went pay for his flight. Yeah, and I told him I shouldn't. I, you should be paying me for the first flight. I paid you to get there. So the, the new policy I need to institute is you you figure out how to get there. I'll figure out how to pay you back. There Anyways, you go. That was a, again. Um, I mean, that was a skill set I learned. Yeah, the tactical job itself was. It is what it is. Um, the coordination though was worth it. And again, that's where we went far and wide. Well, not so far and wide. We went. Um, we went wide on our sk- skill uh, uh, offering. It was, you know, something we didn't t- typically do. However, who we did it for was one company. And once we figured out the first one, you know, it's like, yeah, the first three sucked. Was like, what, like nine, 12, whatever. So like, let's call it the first 30% sucked. The next 30% we perfected, you know, we we were like, oh, this is kind of normal. And then the last 30% were like, oh, fuck, this is boring. Like, what, all right, what's the next challenge? Like, it was, it was, it was enjoyable because it actually went the way we had planned it the whole way. It just, it took time. And to Casey's point, is a uh, a perishable skill. If we were that good at other things that we could do year round, be mul- ten, Casey oh wouldn't even God. need fucking ten streams of revenue. You know. <laughs> Dude, so was so this was this demo work at McDonald's? A- no, no, no. no. We uh, disassembly. I mean, we it was- disassembled thirty six thousand. Pieces of product. Oh, that was a hundred thousand. No, thirty six thousand. Felt like a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand pieces it had to been actual partitions, right? No, it was thirty six thousand partitions. Thirty six thousand. Wow. Like million. It was <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds of plastic, aluminum, steel, plastic grommets, cardboard. I got hand cramps just from the drill. Oh no, no yeah. shit, just from the impact drill. And by the last yeah. two jobs, we're like, "Fuck, this was a lot easier if we just figure out." Because the learning curve, there was, there was. Oh there, yeah. Like you, you mentioned earlier, University of YouTube. There ain't no YouTube videos on how to do this. No. Like no. this was, this this took my collective knowledge of like Six Sigma, and uh, efficiency processing, and yeah. And then it took That's Casey's it took Casey's skill set of managing a team of like uh, upwards of what twenty five people, almost thirty people, I think at one yeah. point we had on a floor. Mm-hmm. There are temp employees that say they're going to the bathroom and 50 50 they come back. Like, <laughs> right before lunch, you got 20 guys. After lunch, you got 12. And you just, right, no, so you just I make lunch later. Eight vets. <laughs> I wrangled up eight vets that were with us on most of the jobs. Yeah, yeah. that were willing to travel the country. Yeah, yeah. the whole thing. And I mean, crazy. with a week notice, it wasn't like, hey, in a couple months, we're doing this. It was like, hey, look, next week, this is what's going on. A, a week is being generous. One guy showed up. Two days later in California, we said, "Hey, you want to go to Atlanta?" Yeah. He's like, "Cool." Oh, I can't remember sure. his issue though. I think it was, Justin, he was like, "What's that?" You remember Justin? Yeah, no, Justin. Yeah, Justin was like less than a day notice. Called him on yeah. Monday afternoon. He was there by Tuesday morning. Zero fucks. That guy was that was legit. No, the guy that met us in uh, Stockton, California, and then uh, oh, I can't yeah, remember. He's guy. like, he was awesome. And I was like, "Hey, can you fly?" He's like, "I don't know." He goes, "I don't have a credit card or nothing." I was like, "Do you have an ID? Do you have a ID that's valid?" He goes, "Yeah." I go, "All right." Just go to the airport. I will fly you to to Atlanta. He's like, oh, I, I, maybe or maybe that's what it was. He'd never been on an airplane. Never or he never, an airplane. That's what it was. He'd never been on an airplane before. Yeah. I'm like, you want to go to Atlanta? So he goes, like, make a wish foundation all all in one. <laughs> we'll pay you. We'll make dreams come true all at one time. Yeah, that guy was awesome. So so Adam, if <laughs> if there was a standard to what we were doing we would have probably lost the job and having known everything yeah. that we know now, we probably could have charged more and got it because they didn't even know how to get done what we got done. Like yeah. no one knew it was more like, this is how it's going to be done. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Go ahead. 
damn it, yeah, I'm and, and, ask for way more money. Oh yeah, and and when we had such a high fucking number to start, it looked like a really high number, and and until, or again, it, it, it worked out. It, it ended up being oh, profitable, yeah. but um, there was just yeah. no, like he said, like you, there was no video to hey, how do I properly disassemble this the most efficient way? It was like uh, throw it in a shredder. I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah. 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 So, so I know we went off track, but the good thing about that is Adam, like you're going to figure out things on the fly and mm-hmm. you're also going to get put into opportunity or, or getting put, put in positions where opportunities are right in front of you. And a lot of people, this is what I don't like about America these days. It's so easy. Like, Oh, I wasn't given the same opportunities as everyone else. No, that's kind of bullshit. Yeah. Like, you were, bull- you just didn't entertain them. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Andy gave me a week notice pretty much. I mean, I was I was already on my way out of my, my franchise and I went up to Chicago to meet him, saw what he was doing, and I was like, okay, when's the next job? And he's like, look, man, it's next week. It's and in I Texas. Like, I already got you scheduled. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was it was a lot of trust. Obviously, I knew Andy, I wouldn't have just done it, but it was a lot of trust and I knew what I was capable of. Right. So I entertained that opportunity. And at no point in time, and you can ask Andy this, at no point in time was I ever stuck to where I couldn't call it and say I'm done. Like I could have at any point in time. Oh yeah. Um there was shit, there was times we talked. There was times (laughs) we talked. (laughs) He kicked he kicked me out of a warehouse one day because I needed to be kicked out of a warehouse one day. He he literally (laughs) says, Go back to the hotel room, open up some Excel spreadsheets and figure the figure out what you need to fucking figure out. Because yeah. (laughs) Me, me, I, I, I am not a, and I've done it in the past. I, I, when I worked for waste manager, I ran a, a ran a floor, a production facility. We, we process medical waste. Not me in my strong suit. I am better at the Excel spreadsheet, setting the vision. So I'm going to go, uh, so that's why Casey and I work too. It's like, I, I had to get into business with my brother and I didn't realize he, my brother was the execution guy. was a vision. And then when my brother got out and I got back in, I'm like, oh, I need someone that can execute because I can have the ideas. I can win the contracts. I can I can develop the plan. As soon as the plan's developed, I'm kind of the fuck over it. Like go out, you know, do a little R and D, and then execute thereafter. Um, yep. Yeah. And with you, it's like at first year, Adam, you got to go and just execute a bunch of shit, and then figure out what actually really motivates me. Like your your overall thing is not having a boss. Awesome. Like I get it. I don't want one either. Or a job. I get it. And yet you still have to have a plan, right? Because you said at the beginning, I want. I, I hope to not be working here. Well, what's the plan to not work at your company? Yeah. And when you write it down and you start to actualize it, right? A plan, a not written down plan is a thought. It's nothing. Yeah. A plan once yeah. it's written down, it's something. And at least you start to execute on it. Like we talked about the guy last week, his plan was to buy a truck and flip it. He bought a truck. That was the plan. And they turned it <laughs> turned into a junk or a trash company. Cause he had a yeah. plan. Mm-hmm. That's the thing with you. You got to write down a plan. And then also to get buy-in from your, your um, strategic partners, i.e. your wife, right? They got to have something to chew on. Like, I, I remember that from Casey. We started doing the McDonald's plan. He's like, all right, so what's the plan? I was like, oh, we'll just figure it out. I got, I got like, because I had done all the data, all the research. He's like, yeah, yeah, but what's the plan? I was like, we'll just go there and figure it out. I've already done it. He's like, no, I need to know what the plan is, right? And so yeah. once I communicated the plan and I brought him into the planning part, it was good. And then he got to the shops or he got to the job sites. He's like, this isn't going to plan. I go, yeah, I know. This is what, like, we, we had a plan. It went to shit. Now you know what to adjust. Yeah, yeah, we had a plan. And and it took him, I don't know, probably would take you case two, three job sites where you're finally like, okay, our plan has got to be a hell of a lot less rigid. We got to. Yeah, like, dude, for instance, <laughs> I mean, two things that pop out, of, two things that stick out. One was equipment. We, our original plan was for some reason to buy all new equipment everywhere we went, right? Like drill sets and shit. Then we yep. figured out, oh, it's actually way cheaper just to carry it with us on the plane. It's. And fly it to where we're going. Yeah, because we have yeah. a bunch of stuff you couldn't put on check bags. Yeah. 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 And then another aspect of it was at first we were paying for hotel rooms, mm. which was stupid. And then we switched to Airbnbs. Why not house everybody together for one flat rate instead of paying everybody's stupid hotel room? Right. Yep. So those were two things you learned right when you started it. But yep. that that's how it goes. I mean, that's small business 101. And, and I was going to tell you this before, but you are taking a commitment and I want you to remember this even in two years from now, let's say you're, you're just killing it, but you're, maybe you're, you're having a bad day. You're, you're taking a commitment now to say, Hey, I'm better 
than just being an employee. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be my own boss. I want to have the freedom. But in that, it requires there's no on or off switch. You're not going to just mm -hmm. clock in and clock out. You have to earn boundaries. You can't just set them. I know it sounds yep. crazy. Oh, I'm my own boss. But if you want yeah. to be successful, yeah. you have to earn those boundaries. You can't just and, jump and in. You and, and you have to set them. You also great. You have to earn you them, and to. you have to set them. Because yes. me, I earned them, and I never, I didn't set them for years. I didn't set them, and then, be, yep. then my business owned me. I didn't own my business, and now yeah. I have clear yeah. boundaries. I tell people my boundaries are like uh, actually, Casey. All of a sudden, Carolyn called me last Friday. I was training our new ops person, mm -hmm. nine fifty nine in the morning, and I was like, all right, something's fucked up. I picked up. I was like. Hey, what's going on? And she goes, Hey, do you use Calendly? And I'm like, Yeah, that's you know, to book that's a way to book uh, uh appointments with people. And we talked for like 10 minutes about because she wants to bring it into her sales company, whatever. Like we talked pure 10 minutes. Like she was calling me not as her boyfriend, she was calling me as a, a business, you know, a peer within business. Nice, yeah. Right. For advice, because she's like, I watched a bunch of videos. I just you already use it. How does it work? Like, what are the downsides? What are mm -hmm. the pitfalls? What's the push I'm gonna get for my sales team? Right. And it's like, okay, cool. Cause we have a very clear boundary that works great for us. We don't call each other during the day. Not once do, do I talk to her on the phone before 5 PM ever, unless there's something significant. Like we got to figure something out that we already knew about fine. Right. There's other people where they're used to hearing from their spouse throughout the day. Like that to me is so fucking foreign. And I had an ex that wanted me to call her through two, three times a day. Yep, that didn't happen. Well, that that goes in the beginning. It's that's communication, right? So yeah, set that boundary, right? And say, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're married, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, me and my <laughs> wife, we were used to talking more often than none, but there was also times when I was in junk room. She knew if I didn't answer my phone, I wasn't dodging her phone call. I wasn't hanging out with her chicks. Yeah. I was probably yeah. cleaning out a garage, or I was probably yeah. in the attic. You know what I mean? Like I was. Yep. She knew. She knew I was productive and being too busy to answer or whatever. So then after that, I had to kind of reestablish because in the beginning of my second phase of, of life business, there was a lot of chasing and, and getting business to where I had no, really, I didn't have a lot of opportunities. I couldn't answer the phone. So I had to say, you know what, in between these two hours, like text me first, if it's important, obviously I'm going to call or I'm going to answer. But if I miss your call, I feel obligated to call you right back, no matter what I'm doing. And it created stress. And so it's one of those things, set that boundary, earn it though. You know, when it comes to, I want to be off weekends. Yep. I don't want to stay up till 11 o'clock doing business plan bullshit. You got to earn that shit first. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and cut it that's off. Thing. You say, we're, great. You're, you're like, you know what? Plan one night a week that you don't do business. You're home by five. You have dinner. That's the one night. I don't fuck around. That is the night. Every other night yep. it's 8 PM. And then here's the deal. You can always justify sitting in front of the computer later. But if you're like, hey, you know what? 8 p.m. I'm done. Whatever the rule, whatever your rule is, you leave. If you don't get the shit done you need to get done, guess what? You didn't get any need to done. You didn't need to get it done that bad, right? Or you need to be more efficient because when yeah. you don't have that family support and that foundation, right? Maybe you'll start at 10 p.m. Oh, I remember being at the shop till 10, 11 o'clock at night, my first yep. six months, right? Yep. And then you dial it back to, you know, nine and then eight. My rule is I don't take my laptop home during the week. I do take it home mm. on the weekend, so I have it with me. I don't take my laptop home during the week. I know if I leave here with my laptop in hand, I will go home and I will work. And I might as well just stay here at the mm. shop. Because when I'm working from home, I don't get shit done after 5 yeah. p.m. Now, if I stick around the shop here for a couple hours, I can fucking, I can crank. I get some shit done. You know? <laughs> and I don't have anybody at home waiting for me most days. I just know I need to do it mentally. Otherwise, I'm going to sit in front of my computer. And then I want to do, I'm going to wake up in the morning go right back to my computer. Stuff on something. Anyways, all right. We've just been talking about random shit. What other <laughs> any other questions or concerns before we uh before we hop off? Been a very conversation. Oh man, I don't know. I mean, we covered when to leave. Um, what else I got in here? I don't know. I kind of. It's probably not a topic for the podcast, really. But like commercial, you talk a lot about commercial junk removal, um, and mm -hmm. basically being like your own, not necessarily a salesman, but pitching your pitching your stuff. And I don't know, I'd like to learn how to do that a little better. I feel like I have a good face for it. Well, I, I don't look good on this podcast for some reason, but I have a better face in person um, for talking to people and introducing myself and stuff. But like getting the knack down for sales. Um, well, first, find the demand. Is there a demand for commercial junk removal in your immediate area? And when I say immediate area, if you're driving one hour to meet a job, yeah, not too far. 
Yeah. I don't think there's a, I guess when I say commercial is semi-commercial, but like really real estate agents is what I want to jump on. Cause I see there's a lot of guys, competitors around me are hammering real estate. Um, they're working with all the agents they're doing, you know, boiler removals, all everything. And that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I, I really want to, you know, pay visits to these offices and try well, to. What you just told place. us, tell a commercial agent, Hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee and talk to you about how we could work together? Um, yeah. It's that simple, but we're intimidated by, by it because we're new to it. So it yeah. seems foreign and you're like, how do I talk to these people? I, I've said this, I don't, I don't know how many times, the best salesmen in the world never have to sell anything nope. because they just rely on, on their relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's it. You make these relationships, you're not going to have to pitch them nine times out of 10 after you know someone enough, they'll never ask how much it costs. You're yep. just going to know they're going to take care of you. So when you get to that point and you meet these agents, whether they're commercial brokers or not, take them, first of all, all agents love free stuff. Take them, yeah. I'll buy you a cup of coffee. They're going to show up, all right? It's free. And then maybe take it a step further. Hey, do you have an office nearby? How many people are on your team? Oh, we have 15 agents on our team. That's awesome. Do you think maybe sometime in the near future, I can just bring everybody donuts or whatever and just give a 15-minute little mm-hmm. spiel on how I can help your business or how I can work with you, right? I mean, Andy's done that. I've done that. Don't, and now yeah. you start getting in front don't, of these don't make. Agents. Correct. Don't make it overly complicated. Have a plan. Yeah. The plan doesn't have. That's the challenge. People are like, either they don't have a plan, or be, or they have a plan that's super complicated. My plan for yeah. real estate company is real simple. I walk in, I talk, I ask, right, is there a sales manager I can talk to? I ask them when they have a morning meeting. I ask them what it takes to get it into the morning meeting. I go to the morning meeting. Oh. I fucking have a PowerPoint and some handouts. I bring them food, right? I always ask, hey, what kind of food do they like? And then. And then I follow up, you know, a week later. Hey, how was it? Any other questions that need to be asked? I, you know, if I can get it on their distro, they won't give me the, typically they won't give me the agent's um, contact info, but I can send it to the office manager and maybe they'll push it out a PDF. And then yeah. I move on to the next fucking real estate company, right? I don't yeah. just like, oh, I put all my eggs in one basket. Now I'm going to wait. No, I move on to the next real estate company and the next one and yeah. the next one and the next one. And then once they call, I fucking slay it and I figure it the fuck out. Yeah. Yep. Hell yeah. I like that morning meeting thing. That's that's tits. Yeah. yeah, shit. I don't know, man. I'm just I just wanted to hop on and kind of learn. I've yeah. I've I think I'm up to 82 right now. So like I said, I'm a foreman for construction, and I, I have a lot of time on my hand in a truck. So I just yeah. I throw them on and listen all day. So yeah, I'm learning a lot, and I figured I'd hop on and see what you guys had to say and yeah. really keep listening. Oh. All good. All right, let's go around the horn. What uh, Casey? What top takeaway from today? And my top takeaway is, um, I guess just, just, you know, we talked about so much. You're right. We, we, we talked about a lot of random randomness, <laughs> but I would say attempt, attempt too much, I guess. Um, I don't like saying try cause then Andy's like, Oh, Troy's not a word, but do, do, the fucking thing. do, do a few things yeah. until you find what, what works best and what you like doing best yeah. or most because that's really going to help you. You could get into this and absolutely hate it. And in two or three years, be like, what do I do? I'm stuck. I hate what I'm doing. And I don't know how to get out because it's, it is paying my bills. Or you could f- find out in like a month or two that you don't like doing it and just not do it. Like Andy doesn't mess with demolition. He's yeah. like, I'm good. I don't want to take the time to learn it because I'm just not interested in it. Yep. Yep. Right? I'm, I'm the same way when it comes to other things. Like, I don't want to mess with it because I'm not that guy. So that's my biggest takeaway is just do a few things until you figure out what you like doing the most and how you can best do it. Yep. What was your top takeaway, Adam? Oh, well, they kind of, my top, I would say a, a niche, find a niche. Um, and it also, my other takeaway is to be that guy in town that everybody, you know, wants to call for stuff. So that kind of fights, fights the niche as well. You know, it's like yep. do one thing really good. Point. Yeah, or, or do everything for a small group of people um, halfway good. You know, no, I don't want to say halfway good, but yeah, no, pretty much. Be, be, be reliable. And it goes back to what Casey said, relationships, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my top takeaway was a theme throughout because you said it from the top. Hope is not a plan. Start yeah. with a plan and adjust. Because when you have a plan, you have a desired outcome. And then when you adjust your plan, you can also change your outcome. A lot of people yeah. fail the plan. 
And then they, they have no idea whether they're successful or not. And when you have a plan, you have a desired outcome, and then your plan goes to shit, you can change the desired outcome. You can change the timeline. If you don't have a desired outcome, you can't say, are we ahead of schedule, behind schedule? You don't know what's necessary to make the, ch the changes. So at the very least, have a plan with a desired outcome. And then eventually you'll learn milestones and accountability and responsibility. All those other things start with a plan. So yeah, and and and, and communicate that plan effectively, especially with you. You brought up your wife a few times, right? Tell her, hey, this is the plan. I'm going to quit my job July 1st of next year. In order for that plan to happen, here are all the things I need to do. And here's yep. what I need your support. And if I'm not where I said I'm going to be on, you know, April 1st, well, I, I might not be able to quit July 1st. Hell, I might be able to quit fucking June 1st. Because yeah. you have a plan. Yep. Otherwise, this is the way of in our household is this whole quit in this spring, early summer. So, yeah, uh, this will be a, a big conversation. Yeah, for anyone that listen to the fucking, for anyone that listen to the goddamn podcast the whole way through here, you didn't mention any dates, and I just my hillbilly math, my hillbilly math, little Kentucky windage, we got her dialed in right there, right? Well, I'll say one more thing, one last thing, and get, and just get ready for it. It's annoying, but it's what it takes for every plan. <laughs> It takes about five to 10 little plans. Mm -hmm. You have to plan how you're going to accomplish the big plan, right? So when, yeah. you're, when you're goal setting, set a goal and then plan smaller goals in order to reach that goal. Milestones, yeah. milestones and rocks. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I like it. Um, that's it. All right. Uh, also, Jobber failed to mention this. Jobber, <laughs> yeah. I'll blame Taylor, our producer. Jobber, Jobber, Jobber. Between now and the end of the year, Sign up for Jobber. Get 50% off the first three months for the Connect and Grow plan. Sign up for Jobber. Uh, I, I saw in one of the Facebook groups, someone complaining about House Call Pro. Um, they went from Workies because they didn't like Workies, so they went to House Call Pro. Now they're complaining about House Call Pro. So I already dropped them a line. was like, hey, give Jobber hell. Been running my business for over six years now on Jobber. Um, it doesn't happen unless it's on Jobber. So that's it. Jobber's the end-all, be-all. Use the Jobber. Tell them your boy Andy sent you. Uh, maybe they'll give you a sweet, dope-ass t-shirt like I got. As always, it's been another amazing episode of the Trash Talk Business Podcast. On behalf of Casey Bubba Lawrence and our good friend Adam, I'm Andy Wines. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening. Tap subscribe or follow to get the latest episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a review and tell us